Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, this is your third lecture uh, on this poem, which is called Beowulf. Uh, in this lecture, my target is to cover Beowulf is a history poem or how this poem is parallel to history. So this is my first target in this lecture, but as far as uh, the previous two classes are concerned. So in my previous two classes, we have almost uh, covered uh, the important areas like the central characters which are there in this poem. Uh, okay, and also the wolf is an epic poem and also how this poem represent uh, or can be considered the first uh, epic poem of England or Anglo-Saxon time and whether uh, there is any, you know, religious illusion or references in this poem or not. And why this poem or is this poem interpolated by different priests after uh, uh, you know pagan age when people when people of anglo-saxon time or anglo-saxon people when they uh, you know uh, converted to christianity from their uh, from paganism so is there any interpolation in this poem or not? So we have also covered that area, okay? And now we are going to discuss this poem uh, that whether it is parallel to history or not. The second target of this lecture is that you will know different poetic devices in this poem like alliteration, uh, canning, lightities, and simile. So these are the different poetic devices which are most, you know, which are used abundantly in this poem. Okay, so that, that is our second target in this lecture. And then our third target in this poem is, uh, we will discuss the major themes Okay, which are explored in this poem, like loyalty, reputation, generosity, hospitality, envy, uh, and revenge. So we will explore all these themes. And my fourth target in this lecture is to discuss the different symbols like Herod, okay, uh, the place which uh, was built by the King Rothgar for feast or uh, when they want to celebrate their festival. So they built a, uh, a castle, okay, in which they celebrate uh, different feasts. So what uh, does this hero symbolize? The second, that is the cave, and the third one, that is Grendel Claw and a head and the dragon treasure trove. So these are the target, which we will cover in this lecture. So let me tell you again, that after the completion of this lecture, you people uh, are all the students, they will be able to understand uh, these four area, uh, which are related to this poem. Uh, especially in this lecture. So uh, let's start. So uh, one point to remember is that uh, the poem, this poem, Beowulf, is not history. Uh, in a way, uh, we can say, or to some extent, we can say that Beowulf words runs parallel to history. Although this poem rarely refers to historical facts, 
there are some historical facts in this poem, but uh, the poet rarely mentioned those historical uh, facts. Like take the example of the setting, okay? Uh, which is similar to reality in Denmark and Sweden in the fifth and sixth century, uh, the time of the action in the poem. Okay, and if you look at the social structure of uh, Germanic Cometitus, uh, which did exist, so and the most dominating uh, ritual in the poem, that is the most dominating ritual in the poem. Uh, like the funeral near the beginning and at the end of the epic. Uh, these have been confirmed by uh, archaeological discovery. Means when uh, archaeologists, when they, you know, start uh, to discover more about these people. So they discovered uh, during their uh, search that these things um, like Germanic commentators. So it does exist. Okay, so that is one point as far as Beulf uh, as a history is concerned. So the most famous of these was uh, this archeological discovery that is, uh, happened in 1939. So certain who, that is uh, a kind of discovery by uh, which is called certain who dig, okay, in 1939. So it was a, uh, who was a burial ground for one or more East Indian king in the early 7th century. So its content include a ship burial uh, reminiscent of the funeral of uh, that king, which is called Skel Seafing near the beginning of Beowulf and somewhat like the final resting place of Beowulf himself. So buried with the ship were various gold kinds uh, and pieces of armor, including uh, an impressive helmet. Uh, so these things were discovered. So it means that there are some historical uh, facts, okay, which uh, did exist when the certain who dig occur in 1939. So people discover, uh, you know, the funeral places of these two kings, like Sifeng, which occur in the prologue of the poem Beowulf, and Beowulf, which occur, uh, you know, the final. Uh, stage of the poem. So these the two things uh, and some other uh, things were also discovered like uh, gold coins and also armor. Okay. And along with that armor uh, was a helmet. Okay. So these things represent that the, this poem is based on some historical facts. Uh, apart from these, other artifacts uh, include both pagan and Christian symbols. And these indicate the fusion of culture in England approaching the time of the composition of the poem. So we might remember that Pope Gregory, who served from 590 to 604. So he encouraged uh, Christian missionaries to absorb pagan tradition into Christian ritual in order to promote a smooth transition uh, 
for the pagans. So that is another historical, uh, you know, uh, interpolation. We can say because, as I mentioned in my class, in previous classes, this this poem was interpolated. Okay, and Christian elements were added to this poem. So another historical fact in this poem is the royal ship burial at sea or on land were also part of the Scandinavian culture from at least the fifth century through the ninth. So that is another significant archeological discovery uh, uh, which was at, uh, in Southern Norway, just one of several in Scandinavian. So the tribal feud of the fifth and sixth century are well documented historically. And the death of the King Hezlik in battle uh, 520 is recorded uh, fact. Uh, another custom uh, historically was the concept of war guilt, W E R G I L D, war guilt, which literally means man payment. Okay. So what does it mean now, war guilt? So war guilt is the price set on a person's life according to his social or political station. If a lord or one of his ship uh, tains, sometimes called a retainer, were killed in a feud, so the, the fighting might go on indefinitely. One side killing for vengeance or for revenge, and then the other. So, however, uh, the fighting could be stopped by a payment of war guilt. If a leader were killed, so the offending party could pay a certain amount uh, to have the matter uh, settled. So, that is another historical uh, thing in this poem. So, long before uh, the opening of the poem, Rothgar apparently made such a payment to buy Beowulf's father out of a feud or out of battle. So in part of Beowulf's motivation in coming to fight Grendel is to pay off this family obligation. Means his father was uh, um, kidnapped, we can say. Okay. And later on, Beowulf returned the favor to Rothgar country, and that is to fight Grendel. Okay, so still uh, some uh, historical uh, events are there in this poem, while some things are realistic, others are not. So the world in Beowulf is one of the imagination, we can say. We should not be too concerned about whether Beowulf can hold his breath all day or swim five nights without rest, or for that matter, whether uh, dragons keep treasure to or not. But in Beowulf world or in Beowulf setting, they do because uh, Beowulf poem is one of uh, uh, we can say the work of imagination. So, although there are some historical elements in this, uh, are some historical facts in this poem, but uh, we cannot call this poem uh, a history of anglo saxon time because it is the work of imagination. And as we know that the work of imagination, uh, they are based on reality, but we cannot consider this poem as history because the work of imagination is totally different from that of uh, history or real facts. So you have to remember all these point, okay? Now let's come to uh, the second one, 
and that is the poetic devices which are used in this poem. So Beowulf is an example of English Saxon poetry. We already know, and that is dis uh, distinguished from other poetry by its heavy use of alliteration. Now, what is alliteration? So alliteration is the repetition of initial sounds of words. Let me give you an example, okay? Like the harrowing history haunted the heroes. Okay, let me pronounce this word for you people. The harrowing history haunted the heroes. Now look, notice the initial H sound, okay, in the following lines. Let me repeat this line again. The harrowing history haunted the heroes. So in the original Beowulf, alliteration is used in almost every line. Uh, a line of the poem actually consists of uh, two half lines with a caesura. Caesura is uh, actually a pause between them. Okay. A line of the poem consists of two half line. And in between these two half line, there is caesura, a pause in between these two lines. So usually spacing indicates that pause. And there are some um, examples uh, from the poem and I will share those examples in notes. You can study uh, those for your understanding, okay? So sometime the alliteration which are used in these poems are more complicated. Uh, and has been the subject of many advanced study it means common men, they are unable to understand those illustration. So you have to study it further. So the point for beginning students like you people is that illustration is an important uh, element which is used in Beowulf Okay, and alliteration is as important in Beowulf as rhyme. As for some later poets, uh, Beowulf has no, uh, we can say, no consistent pattern of rhyme, although we can see some occasional internal rhyme sometimes is effective and seems more than accidental. The second poetic device which is used in this poem, that is uh, imagery. Okay, and what is imagery now? Imagery is the use of language that produce pictures in the mind of people when they read something or when they listen something, okay? Or when they are listening or when they are reading something. So imagery in the poem is vivid and often fun. Okay, uh, and all these imageries are frequently related through the use of kennings. Kenning, that is another device which is used uh, in this uh, poem. So to put simply, uh, we can say what is kenning? So kenning are compound expression. Kenning, these are compound expression that use characteristics to name a person or a thing. So one of the most popular examples is Ron Red. Literally the word mean well road. So the Kenning then is for the sea or ocean. Okay, well road means uh, like we can say uh,
like we can say that uh, uh, sea or ocean is a thoroughfare or we can say a public road for the well. So one of the strength of uh, this poem is that there are many uh, canings which are used, you know, a kind of poetic device which is used by the poet, especially in this poem. Like, for example, we can say hand spike, which uh, literally means grendel, tell, okay? Talon means nail, Grendel nail, a hand spy. The second caning is word hoard, okay, means vocabulary. The third one is bone box, means a person body. So these are the examples of uh, caning. And let me explain this term further uh, or let me give you some more examples of kenning. A kenning is a figure of speech in which two words are combined in order to form a poetic expression that refers to a person or thing. For example, well wrote and let me give you some other examples like ankle biter so ankle biter means a very young child like bookworm uh, when someone is so much studious sometimes we call a him or her bookworm means someone who reads a lot okay like another example that is four eyes when someone who wear glasses so these are the different examples of uh, kennings, okay? And I will share the notes and you will understand it further uh, in detail. Another device which is used in this poem, and that is uh, light it is, okay? Which is a figure of speech in which a positive statement is made by the negative of its opposite. So it is a form of understatement, understatement. Uh, we might say, for example, Abraham Lincoln was not too bad a president. Okay, means he was a good president. So it is called light it is. When you uh, underestimate something means when you uh, in which a positive statement is made by the negative of its opposite like Abraham Lincoln was not too bad a president so when we mean to convey that he was a great president so we describe things like this through this poetic device which is called light it is. So when describing Grendel pool, so King Rodger says that it is not a pleasant place. It is in fact filled with horror. Okay, that is an uh, example from uh, the poem Beowulf. And there are some similes which are used in this poem. Uh, and what is simile? So simile often is described as a comparison between two objects, people, or idea through the use of comparatives such as like or as. And one simile occurs in line 218 when the poet tells us that the ship went over the sea like a bird. So like a bird, the ship went over the sea like a bird. So it is simile. 
in which he compare ship to that of uh, bird. Okay, and there are some extended similes as well, which are used in this poem. So as per is the poetry, Dolf is rich in meaning. Some people see it as an early celebration of Christianity. Other think it extols or praise or condemn a heroic values. Okay. And one scholar, he argued that Beowulf is a balance between beginning and ending of youth and age, the most dominating being Beowulf, while the poem is a value historically. As we know that this poem is considered the first uh, Anglo-Saxon poem. So it is more interesting as powerful work of art. Now, let's come to uh, the central themes which are there in this poem. So, as you can see here, uh, that there are many themes in this poem. The first one is loyalty, okay? Now, what is loyalty? So when you have the quality of being faithful to someone, that is loyalty. And let me tell you first about theme, that what, what is theme? So a theme in a literary work is a recurring unifying subject or idea, or we can say a motive that allows us to understand more deeply the characters and their world. So in Beowulf, the major themes reflect the values and the motivation of the uh, different characters. So now look loyalty. So Beowulf, the character, the central character, he embodied loyalty. At every step of his career, loyalty is Beowulf guiding virtue. Uh, like for example, Beowulf comes to the assistance of uh, the Danes for complicated reasons. Certainly he is interested in increasing his reputation and gaining honor and payment for his own king back in Geatland. However, we soon learn that major motivation is a family debt that Beowulf owes to uh, whom? To Rothgar. So this young Geat is devoted to the old king because Radgar came to the assistance of Beowulf's father. Uh, and that is uh, HTU years before. Now, deceased HTU had killed a leader of another tribe in a blood feud. So, when the tribe sought revenge, Radgar then, a young king, Shelter Beowulf's father and settle the feud by paying uh, tribute or war guilt, as I mentioned above, in the form of a fine old treasure. So, HTU uh, are to the HTU enemies. So, Radgar even remembers Beowulf as a child. So, the tie between the families go back many years, and Beowulf is proud to be able to lend his loyal services to Rothgar. This is one example of loyalty from this poem. And there are many examples in many themes, okay, and many events which showed the loyalty of different characters to their kings, to their lords, like, uh, for example, the loyalty of, uh, uh, you know, Beowulf to his king, 
to other kings there in uh, uh, Rothgar or uh, to some other kings as well, like for example, his uncle's son, because he was also uh, later on became the king of uh, that country. So he was also uh, loyal to uh, a Hedgelik, okay, and his son Hardred. Now, the second theme which is there in this poem that is reputation. And what is reputation? So, reputation means the opinion that people have about what somebody, something is like based on what has happened in the past. That is reputation. So another motivating factor for the wolf and central theme in the epic is reputation. From the beginning, Beowulf is rightly concerned about how the rest of the world will see him. He introduced himself to uh, scalding by citing achievement that gained honor for him and his king. So when a drunken unfurth verbally assault Beowulf at the first banquet, so at issue is the hero's reputation. So unfurth uh, you know, he insults Bewol because his reputation is his most valuable position. So reputation is also the single quality that endeavors after death. Uh, has one key to immortality. So that is why Bewolf later leaves the gold and the cave beneath the pool of that grendel after defeating the uh, Grendel mother. So preparing to return with Grendel head and the magic sword a held rather than the treasure. So he had and continues to amass treasure. His intent now is in building his fame or his uh, reputation. And there are some many example, and there are many example of reputation in this poem. Uh, for which, uh, you know, Beowulf fought. Okay, this third theme, which is there, that is generosity and hospitality. Okay, so when the poem opens, so you will see the king, King Rothgar and Queen Veltiu. So these two characters embody the themes of generosity, in hospitality, the code of commentators is at the heart of the Beowulf epic. So in this system, the king or feudal lord provided land, weapons, and share of treasure to his warrior called Thanes, or retainer. Okay? So in return for their support of the leader in battle. So the leader's generosity is one of his highest quality. And there are more than... 30 different terms for king in the poem. And many uh, of them have to do with this role as a provider. Like for example, he is the ring giver or the treasure giver, uh, or we can say his seat of power is the gift throne. So these are the different uh, examples in this poem, but you have to remember two characters for generosity and hospitality. And that is uh, King Rothgar and his wife, Beltiu. They are the most generous and hospitable person in this poem. Uh, the fourth theme, and that is envy. Now what is envy? So envy is the feeling of wanting to be in the same situation as somebody else. Now, when you study the poem, so you will confront one character, and that is Anfarth. Okay, he was jealous of Beowulf. Okay, uh, when Grander, who has menaced Rothgar people or killed Rothgar people for twelve years, in envious of 
because he was envious of Danes, because he can never share in mankind's hope or joy. Okay, like we can say that it was unbearable for him to uh, share mankind a hope or joy. So the monster motivation is one of the few undeniably Christian influence in the field. Grendel is a descendant of Cain, the biblical son of Adam and Eve, and who killed his brother Abel out of jealousy. That is another example, biblical references in the poem. Uh, or biblical references of uh, envy, which is explored in this poem. So, uh, the legend is that, that the monster of earth are Cain's descendant and eternally damned. So, Grendel resents men because God blesses them but will never bless him. So, the bright lights and sounds of joy uh, emanating from Rothgar's magnificent mead hall hero, especially annoy the Grendel, and he was envious of a human joy. The fifth a theme which is there in this poem that is revenge. And this theme is a motivating factor for several characters throughout the poem. Initially, starring Grendel and his mother, uh, Grendel seek revenge upon mankind for the heritage that he has been dealt, and he delights in raiding uh, or attacking that mead hall because it is the symbol of everything that he detests about men, their success, joy, glory, and favor in the eyes of God. So Grendel's mother revenge is more specific. She attacks that mead hall because someone uh, there killed her son. So although she is smaller and less powerful than Grendel, but she is motivated by uh, a mother's fury. Uh, and when Beowulf goes after her uh, in the mare, so then what happens? She has uh, the added advantage of fighting him in her own territory. And as she drags him into her cave beneath the lake, so her revenge peaks because this is very man who killed her son. So only both amazing abilities as a warrior and the intervention of God and magic can defeat uh, her. So that is another theme which is uh, there in this poem. So revenge also motivates the many feuds that the poets refer to and is a way of life and death for uh, Germanic uh, tribes. Now let's come to the different symbols which are there in this poem. So one symbol that is Herod, uh, a mead hall. Now what is symbol? So a literary symbol is something upon an object that stand for a significant concept or series of ideas. And often a symbol is emblematic of the values of the character. And we will sum up the most important symbols are Rothgar's Mead Hall, Grendel Cave, Grendel Arm and Head, and the Dragon Treasure Trove. So Rothgar Mead Hall, Herod, uh, function is both setting and symbol in the effect. It is much more than a place to drink symbolically. Uh, this hall represents the achievement of those peoples, specifically Rothgar and their level of civilization. The hall is a home for the warrior who sleep there and function is a seat of government. It is a place of light, warmth, and joy contrasting with Grendel's morbid swamp as well as the dark and cold winter in Scandinavia. So in Herod, Rodger celebrates his victories and rewards his ten warrior with uh, various treasures, gifts, okay, gold, 
So the building is like a palace. It towers high and is compared to a clip. Okay, so this is uh, a symbol in the poem, which are uh, symbolically represent different things in the poem. The second symbol in this poem is the cave, where Grendel and his mother hide from the world is a symbolic of their lives is outcasts. Means uh, a person or a thing who is not accepted by other people. So these Grendel and uh, Grendel mother, they are not accepted by those uh, people, by the people of uh, uh, Danes or Geats. So hidden beneath a treasure mare in the middle of a door uh, and they are forbidding swamp. The cave allows them a degree of safety and privacy in a world that the view is hostile. So they certainly are not welcome in Herod and they know it. So the cave also represent their heritage as descendants of Cain and they are associated with the uh, black magic, demons, ancient runes, and hell itself. Uh, when Grendel mother is able to fight Beowulf in the cave, so she has a distinct advantage. His victory is all of more uh, significant. Mm. Okay, so cave is another symbol in this poem. And caves are also, uh, you know, cave symbolize mystery also in this poem, okay? And you can further uh, study uh, cave symbols in detail. I will share the notes, but you have to know uh, that caves, especially in this poem, uh, symbolize you know, dark are uh, the heritage of those grindles, okay, which are associated with black magic, uh, demons, and ancient runes, and hell. So these are uh, the different uh, ideas, okay, which are symbolized by the cave. Now, the Grendel's claw and head. So Beowulf had hoped to have an entire Grendel body to represent to King Rothgar after his battle with uh, Grendel and Herod. He has to settle for the right arm or claw ripped from its shoulder socket when the mortally wounded adversary flees to his own place. So the claw is hung high beneath that mid hall. Okay, is a symbol of Beowulf uh, victory. So you have to remember this. And then the last one that is the dragon treasure trove. So the dragon treasure trove uh, represent the vanity of human wishes. Elve is. Uh, the mutability of time means that uh, that can change. Okay, time can change, are likely to change with the passage of time. So the dragons uh, large pile hold with wealth in abundance, yet the wealth is of no use to anyone. So the ancient treasures in the horde once belonged to a regional tribe of warriors who were killed in battle some 300 years previously. Only one survivor who is called the keepers of the ring left to hide the treasure in the barrow. So just as the dead warriors cannot use the treasure, neither can the dragon. So he devotes his life to guarding a treasure that he apparently has no use for Beowulf. Uh, okay, uh, or we can say that it has no use for the people of their time. So Beowulf gives his life defeating the dragon 
and gaining the impressive treasure for his people, but they won't benefit from it either. So the treasure is buried with great warrior in his funeral uh, barrow, and are told remains there still is mighty, uh, you know, a hoard of riches that is absolutely no use to anybody. So that is another theme, and that is the dragon's treasure trove, which is of no use to anybody. Uh, or we can say that treasure symbolize the human wishes. People collect wealth, although they cannot get any benefits from that wealth. So these are the human wishes, just like uh, uh, that a dragon. So that treasure do not have any benefit to that of the dragon, but he wish to protect all those treasure uh, and guard all those uh, treasure. As we as human beings, we collect, you know, money, gold, and all these things. And, and at the last, these are left to some other people. And we wish in our life that we have a uh, treasure like uh, that of dragon. But actually these treasure have no use. Uh, or we cannot use uh, all these treasure when we are alive. Okay. And when we become uh, dead, so these are left to some someone else. And so the process is uh, in continuation. So these are <clears throat> the different, uh, you know, areas which I consider uh, the most important uh, one. That is why I discuss all these in detail and I will also share the notes and you can study it for yourself. If you have any questions, so you can uh, put those questions in the comment box and also you can share your question in uh, WhatsApp group. Thank you so much for listening.